spirituality here in the old city of Jerusalem at Asia Torah, overlooking the Western Wall. Today we're discussing the uh, experiences all around souls and death and reincarnation and all that, all that business. Um, it's one of the more important things to note about life is, is death. It's one of the more important things to note. In fact, uh, today's Daf Yomi talks about it. Gives it is a Maimer Chazal that um, that says that um, all humans are born to die and all animals are born to die. And um, Asher Ish, she, happy is the person who spent his life toiling over Torah and made Torah his, his uh, made Torah his focus. And, and, um, and that Torah ultimately will be your, your, next, your next world will be created out of the Torah that you learned. Very interesting. The rest of the Daf started talking. The rest of the Amud started talking about how women have a higher chelik than the men. Even why? Because of their um, I don't know. There was some kind of purity of faith that women had that that gave them an even higher place. the The only thing you know when you're born is that you will die. And it's similarly mirrored by history because the earth was created, that's born. And we know that there will be a messianic era at the end of days, which is like the end, like that's the culmination. So there's creation and there's culmination. Things culminate, they end. And, and you're also born and you will die. Now the middle of creation is what's called revelation. Revelation is is the Mount Sinai experience where we get to know what God wants because until Revelation, you have to kind of figure it out what God wants. After Revelation, you can know what God wants. In your own life, you have birth, you have death. So what's missing in the middle? What do you need in the middle? Revelation. You have to have a revelation, a personal revelation. A revelation about what's life all about, what's your life all about. Now, every um, person has two. Um, every person has two revelations. Oh, you just blew that thing. There's two revelations that you have to have while in your life. One has to do with um, having a mystical relationship with God, and now if you're Jewish, it would be a Jewish revelation. If you're not Jewish, you'd just be a, a, they're the same. It's a God revelation. It's a recognition of like the point of it all. But if you're Jewish, so it's highly detailed. If you're Gentile, so it's like keep the seven, go to heaven. You know, keep the seven laws of Noah, and you're all good. So that's Jewish. And the other revelation is what's called Jewish. So there's Jewish and Jewish. And I actually have broken up my life specifically to these two things. Every day I teach about being Jewish at Asian Torah. And every night, and not every night, but certainly every night this week, running my seminar, I have a seminar called The Possible You, which is all about being Jewish. But you have to have them both. They have to, you have to have both of these. Now, what's interesting is the black hat world, you know, has... has uh, The black hat world has a, um, you know, basically, because of the Enlightenment and all of everything that happened with the Haskalah movement, they wanted to get rid of the Jewish part, and it was enough just that you say Amen a certain amount of times a day, and Baruch Hashem Kavod Malchusoy, and, and uh, uh, Baruch Hashem, when someone asks you how you're doing, and every time you come back from a wedding and someone says, how was it, you say, very nice. And after Shabbos, you say it was very nice. You're part of this, like, very nice club where everything was very nice. You know, how was it? Very nice. So, you know, they wanted you to just become, like, this generic kind of Jewish person. And I understand them, but, but there's actually this whole self-expression aspect that's also, you know, really important. And God will ask you both of them when you die. Like, you got to know both when you die. You know, the, way, the way I say it, out of at risk of repeating myself too many times on this one, is every Jew is born with a hook in their mouth. 
you know, like fishermen fish, and you want to get a hook into a fish's mouth. Well, you were born with a hook in your mouth. And God will reel you in at the end of your life. Now, when you reel a fish, so the fish fights. Meaning when you, when you actually try to reel in a fish, the fish fights. But you could break the line. So fishing rods have, have gears. There's a gear on the reel where you can flip it, and it lets out lines so the fish can run. You let it run. And eventually you feel the fish is getting tired. It's getting old. And <laughs> after a while it gives up its fight, then you can just reel it on in back to the boat. And so if you ever notice, like, the, uh, I'm sure all of us know certain people, maybe relatives or friends or people in the community that seem to be running away from the boat of Judaism. They're running away from Jewish. And, and you kind of wonder sometimes, like, how does God put up with that? And the answer is God's chill. Just like you're chill. You're chill if you caught a big fish and it's already on the line and it's running. You're not nervous about it. There's no anxiety. You're just chill. Go ahead and run. Already got a hook in your mouth. And then at the end of life, you get reeled in. Now, smart people who are hanging around the Torah community and hanging around learning Torah and involved in Torah and mitzvahs and avoda, they are people that choose to hang around the boat. Like you might as well hang around the boat till God reels you in, hang around God. And that, that's going to be better for you altogether. Now, once God reels you in and he gets you up on the boat, he's going to have two questions for you. Were you Jewish or were you Jewish? So if you answer good on both, then you're in a, the world of souls. But if you answer not good on one of the two, so then you're sent back into the pond. And so you might ask a Haredi Jew, were you Jewish? And he'll say, I was the most Jewish. And you ask him, were you Jewish? If he says, I don't know what that means exactly. So then he's going back into the pond. But it also means that secular Jews who are excellent at self, you know, self-awareness and they're excellent at self-expression and all that stuff, they may answer very well on the Jewish part, but they may not answer so well on the Jewish part. And so we have to have both of these going at all times. Now, back to being born to die is Judaism wants it to be, and not just Judaism, but many mystical traditions have a really intimate and peace, uh, not peaceful, but at peace relationship with death. We're actually supposed to be really connected to death. We're supposed to mention death every day. We're supposed to think about death. We're supposed to, if we have a choice between a party and a funeral, we're supposed to go to the funeral. We're supposed to be like really connected to death. And, and that's, uh, we learn that in various places. Um, certainly the, uh, the Torah shows like really long lifespans and God sees that's not going to be so good. So he like shortens it so that people get moving towards death. Um, we mention every day uh, in the second paragraph of our daily meditation. It's all about the recitation of the dead, resuscitation of the dead. And the... But death's supposed to be a big part of your life. And the more death's a part of your life, the more you're alive. And the more you push away death, the more you want to avoid it, the more you want to like, you know, not be around it, the less alive you'll be. And, and the more the you'll, you'll, you'll yeah, whatever, you, when, when you're really real with death, then you're really real with alive. And so, and so you'll, you'll use your time here well if you're very real with death. And there was another thing I noted years ago was when reading the genius of 19th century authors, um, early 19th century had some of the best writers ever. And I was reading these books and, and realizing there's such genius here. And I would go to the front of the book to see the biography of the author, and every one of them had a brush with death. Author after author. And then I started realizing the same thing with the the masterpieces in Europe, in, the, in, the, in art, in sculpture, in music. Every one of these, like the ones that are remembered forever, like for centuries, these great ones, all had serious brushes with death when they were children. Either a parent died, or a sibling died, or they themselves almost died. But one thing's for sure is it caused them to put on their running shoes and to start moving in their lives. Another good reason to be really... Uh, close to death is, is that uh, when a person dies, 
they don't realize they're dead at first. It takes them a little while to realize. Why? Because your body anyway is dead. It's only your soul that keeps your body alive. It's the soul that, it's your soul that keeps your body vivified. And so your body's really dead without it. Now, when you die, the, it's the, the same soul. It's, nothing happened to it. You're still there. So you don't even realize you're dead when you're dead. And so, and so it's more apparent by the people around the room that you're like, something's wrong here. You know, like, why is everyone's, like, all of a sudden everyone's upset, you know? And then you're kind of noticing the sheet going out over you, even though you can't really necessarily feel your body, but it's like, it's like, and now you're hearing crying and stuff, and you're like, I'm still here, you know, what's everyone so upset about? You know, but after a while, it starts to dawn on you, they're upset about you, you know, and, and so, anyway, but that's a whole process from like the second, the, the soul didn't really leave the body, the soul was never in the body, the, the soul, soul somehow, we don't even know how. That's why we say um, on the bathroom blessing, the last two words are umafli la sos, which means, and he acts wondrously. What's the wondrous act? That the soul and the body are even connected, meaning the fact that your soul would follow you into the lobby after a class, that's like weird. Like, how does it, how is it even around you? Like, because the soul's purely spiritual and the body's purely physical. And how can they be, where's the connection? What's the USB cable interface? between the two, and yet we know they're interfaced. And I, I recently did a class on that interface, so I'm not going to talk about that. So, so, the, so the more you're recognizing that your soul is eternal, and the body is ephemeral, and the body is ultimately going to meet its end, the, the more likely that you'll get the picture when you die. And they, they say that the, soul of, the death of Sadiqim is like a kiss, but the death of people who were living as if their body was who they were, are, it's like trying to pull wool out of a comb. You know, it's just all tangled up in there. It doesn't release well. And, and it's even said that the, that the person can so not realize they're dead that they, I mean, this wouldn't be anyone in this room, obviously, and hopefully hearing this class even will save you from what I'm about to say. But there are people that are so, in, so connected to the body that they, um, that they don't realize they're dead even after they're buried. And they're literally like, you know, they're like scooping dirt, you know, and, and it's landing on you, and it's like, hello, like, you know, the at this point they're like screaming that they're not dead, and, and they're like, you know, next thing you know, they're six feet under, and they're still conscious under there. And so they, uh, but, but they say that at the end of that experience, then the soul finally pops like it finally, like, you know, you know, like, g good morning and smell the coffee, you're dead. You know, like, at that point, then you know. And so none of us will deal with that, obviously, because we'll be much more mature in recognizing that we're souls more than we're bodies, and that we just have a body, it's a vehicle, and, you know, if you drive a car, you'll have several of them. And so, too, if you have a soul, you'll have several bodies throughout your life and, and not to get too attached to it but take but on the same time take amazing care of it right there's a lot of don't do's on the body you know you gotta let's do the do's here are the do's sleep well eat well exercise like you, you it's really important that your body's running in tip top shape so that you don't notice it because if your body's uh, complaining you ever notice when your body complains? It consumes your, your thoughts and your, your soul. Again, we didn't do the interface, but your soul's interface with the body is very much connected to the thoughts. And if your thoughts are on your stub toe or on your big belly or on your, or on your you know, tiredness all the time or on any other back pain or headaches or whatever, you'll notice it just consumes you. It's like the ultimate expression of reductionism where your massive soul's been reduced to a physical ailment. And that's why being in top shape is the, one of the more spiritual things you can do. And in fact, I think Judaism is the only tradition in the world that, meaning only today, obviously, but Judaism might be the only tradition in the world in its modern 
experience that completely ignores hell um, in the spirituality. Meaning you could be a you could be a Torah scholar, deeply invested in your Judaism, while being you know twice your natural weight, chain smoking and eating junk food, and and having a crazy sleep schedule, and you're still considered like on a high level. Whereas in all the other traditions, you'll notice that spirit and body are together. Like if you have high-level spirit hygiene, like the man I just described, you'd also have high-level body care. Like you'd be taking really good care of your body. Those would go together. And they should go together also in in the Jewish world. And you see throughout Chazal, throughout our our sages talk a lot about health and taking care of our bodies. And that's not something you can ignore all those chazals. And the Rambam also reiterates it and goes uh, into great detail on how to take care of ourselves. Yeah? Everything you're saying is definitely true, but sometimes when people become obsessed with it, also their thoughts are just completely thinking about that. They're obsessing over the fact that they need to help them. That's right. Well said. So, and one more thing is don't obsess about it. Don't obsess about it. Just do, what's called, do what would be maintenance and move on. Just take care of yourself in general. Um, another thing that everyone should try, though, that's very easy to try, is skipping a meal regularly. Um, skip a meal regularly, like meaning every... Uh, skip one meal every two days, let's say. And that, that's really, really good for your eating habits, to skip a meal every two days, something like that. Um, not on Shabbos, obviously, but skip a meal like every two days. Just start getting a, more, a better perspective on food, and, and that helps you a lot. Skip a meal. Also... Do a juice week. Um, my family, we any given kid could be doing a juice week that week. My teenagers will just do a juice week, and it's amazing. Like your energy goes so up, and and your relationship to food gets totally changed because your food's just ground up in a blender every day. So it's no longer f- it's just food. You put on the bottle food, and all the emotional relationship to food just. After, after you do a couple juice weeks, meaning a juice week and then a month later a juice week, you're, you start to shed your emotional relationship to food after a while. And it becomes more of what it is, you know, which is fuel for the body. Yeah. Oh, the greatness in, uh, like, deprivation. So, so a lot of the... There are people who are, like, totally outside the body. Right, but you exist outside the body. So in that I, have a, I have someone like that in my life. He's, my, he's taught me the most of all my Torah, someone who, who lives their life like that. Right, like, my, the, my teacher should technically be alive. He sleeps two hours a day, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Thursday's up all night and Friday's up all night. And then, but he schluffs after the chillant. And, and he only eats, he only eats what keeps his body alive. And he's been doing this for 40 years. I've never seen him eat a meal. I've been there for Yom Tavim. I've been there for Shabbos. And if you saw him eat, you'd just be like, that's not called eating, Rabbi. Yeah, you have not eaten yet. And, and he just doesn't really eat. Anyway, but he did actually get not well at one point, And he had to go to a doctor. And the doctor asked him, so what do you eat it every day? And he said, I eat two slices of white bread. And the doctor's like, that's, what else do you eat? And he's like, that's it. And he said, well, you, that's why you're not well. You're, you, you're not giving any sustenance to your body. He says, at least switch to whole wheat. And the rabbi says, I can't. And he says, why not? He says, because I looked at the ingredients on the white bread, and it has chemicals and bleaches and all this stuff that are from all over the world. So when I eat that, I raise the whole world up. And, and the doctor's like, well, I got a simple solution. Just take two pieces of whole wheat and put one piece of white in the middle. And you'll have a white bread sandwich. <laughs> and he, he took that advice. And that's all he eats ever since. And he's been fine ever since then. But guess how many years he's gone this way? He's gone this way 40 years already. 40 years. And there was another rabbi... The Amshan of a Rebbe also ate, interestingly, but he, um, 
but he didn't sleep for over 50 years. And he never slept in a bed, meaning if he slept, he'd be standing up. So like, meaning I've asked him a Shiloh, I've asked him a question, and he, w- he went like this. For, literally for like, he's on his feet, sleeping in front of me for about 35, 40 seconds. And then he goes and answers the question. I, I was thinking the whole time like, gee, that must have been a pretty boring question. <laughs> But I mean, then again, if you haven't slept at that point in 40 years, so like, I guess he was just catching, a, catching some Z's during the Shiloh. But he, uh, he lived all these years. So there are people who are like this. There, I know for a fact I have personal relationship with people who are outside of it all. But they're not the average person elbowing you out of the way of the number three bus, you know, you know taking up two seats, chain smoking their way up to the bus. Those, those are not the people. These are non-smoking, you know, like super careful people. No, it's not even Jewish. Jewish is, Jewish is take the physical world and raise it up. Take the physical world and raise it up. They're, they're fixing our generation. They're, they're doing it for us, really. Right. Yes. Yes, it does. Um, but it's not. It's not. They're, they're doing, they're, there are certain Jews who are here for us, and they're not here for themselves. They, they were sent down for very specific stuff, and, and they're, they're fixing stuff. So while you pig out, they're not eating, and it balances it. You know? And they're also, people on that level are souls for many souls, because, like, for example, if you look at a soul... You know, they're like, what, is he going to draw a picture of a saw? Like, if you look at a saw, oh, let's get the pin. So a soul is not a one-to-one relationship. A soul, you know, let's get, say this is one soul here. Okay, I'm not going to put much more than that, but this is a soul. Okay? And that soul has... Many people coming off of it. That one has an arm already. I'll give that one a skirt. So, show me Nagia. <laughs> it's funny, I drew the arm already. You notice I, blew the, I drew an arm instead of a body, so that turned into Shomer again. So anyway, this is a soul, and these are various bodies coming off of that soul. If you do the math. No, no, all at once. I mean, do the math. We're 14 million Jews in the world, but there are only 600,000 root souls. So that means there's automatically, if you do the math, it's about 23 of you are hanging around Earth here. Well, see, that's, you're saying, how's that possible? But that's exactly the misconception, is you've been thinking all this time that body and soul is a one-to-one relationship, like vodka, Red Bull. It's not, it's not a one-to-one. It's one body, that's a one, to a soul that's part of the infinity. And every soul has multiple bodies coming off. Now, obviously, that soul could like vanilla and you could like chocolate because we're all having our different history of our own lives that's going to be very different. We don't share brains. We also don't share tafkidim, meaning, meaning our purpose here is different. On the Jewish... Because there's, there, that tafkid's broken down into many things, you know. Like just running this building, and there's a lot of people with different tafkidim here, but it's one building. Weren't the yeah. broken up? Well, this is a good example of broken up here. No, but like it's separate entities, yeah. There they are. Maybe you're saying something that you need to further explain. Like, this is a drawing of one soul, and, like, white people attach to that one soul, but I thought the 600,000 soul were broken up into more souls. Yeah, here they are. Yeah, so this is one of the 600,000 root souls, and there's four of what mathematically, if it, you broke it down evenly, would be 23 people. Now, here's the f- crazy part. Here's the crazy part. 
is there are people born with this soul and maybe not eating much for all these people, meaning maybe less in the physical world than we are and living kind of a different kind of Judaism, meaning they keep the same Shulchan Aruch, but they're not living like we are because they're carrying all these people. So there are souls that are that one soul. But it even goes more complex than that, is that this whole thing that I've drawn here, this whole thing that I've drawn here is actually coming off of, off of another one. I don't know how to put this. How would I draw this? Should I go with this one? Across or should I do it here? I'm trying to make this into another head. No. Uh, no, it should go like this. It should go like this. That's how it should go. Is that better? Uh, this, is this is a fact, actually. I'll tell you how I prove it. You want me to prove it? Yeah. Oh, you're gonna, you're you're gonna love this. I love when people when I share mystical traditions. I'm always waiting because these days most people they're just like unglued. They're just like, yes, Rabbi, wow, Kabbalah. You know? <laughs> and once in a blue moon, someone says, "Prove it," and I'm like, "Yeah," you know, finally. Because Eshtor, Eshtor, you don't say nothing if you can't back it up. You know, this is where we like, this is where we like prove Torah is divine. This is where we like prove there's a God. So like, I mean, well, I just share all this mysticism and people are just like, thank you, Rabbi. Now I'll leave for spot, you know, and no one ever says prove it. We'll have this one be three gals and a guy and a dude. Yo, so, yo, I got three ladies totally attached to my soul. You know, he's got his, like, his great aunt, his next door neighbor, Ethel, who's like 78, and, and then his niece, who's like four. Can they all die at different times? Can they die at different times? I'm going to have you rethink that question, just in deference for your own honor in this class. So... Anyway, but these are obviously, these are heavy-duty souls. Yeah, these are souls that are heavy-duty. But guess what? There's, a, there's one soul here, or maybe, sorry, let's say a ten-soul person who's got ten of these coming off of him. Yeah, there's ten, meaning this is, you understand, this is a ten-souled soul. I'm not putting the rest of them. This is a 10 sold soul. This is one of the 600,000, each one with 23 souls coming off. And this one's got 10 of those. So 10, 10 of these times 23 would be 230 souls coming off in this world. By the way, it's the, not just this world. It's all the ones that have died too. Think about it. There's a world of souls, which has a hell of a lot more people there than are down here. And they're all still there. They're all still there. They're all just ne'anim as ziva shechina. They're in the vibrations of our world. It's our world's the other end of the vibrational thing. Like, have you ever seen a kid's toy in a market, usually by the checkout counter, where it's got a little flashlight hooked up to all these little pixels of, like, fiber, fiber optic plastic strands, like hair? And when you turn on the flashlight, the end of it makes a color or something. You know what I'm talking about? So we're that color on the end of the whole thing. And the world of souls is the actual light inside the fiber optic pixels. So that's the world of souls. And there's many more souls there than down here. And they're all, they're connected to those souls. I Meaning everything they're doing, they're eating and doing mitzvahs all for the souls of those people. Yeah? I don't know. You'll have to ask a Hindu. The Hindus are really experts in the souls of Gentiles. 
and the Jews are real experts in the souls of the Jews. And by the way, if you if you'd like to more, more the, know more of the details, there's a book that's probably unintelligible, and I don't think anyone's ever translated it. Maybe it has been translated, but the Arizal, who lived uh, about four, four or five hundred years ago, he had his scribe, uh, who's named Chaim Vital. He wrote everything the Arizal taught. And what did the Arizal do? He meditated on the Zohar for many years to unlock it for the generation because it so, it's so hidden, the Zohar. And so, it, and so he unlocked it. He succeeded through years of meditation and God knows what kind of fasts and stuff he did. But he broke through it and, he, and Chaim Vital wrote down the teachings called the Kisve Ari, the writings of the Ari. And one of those volumes is called Shar HaGilgulim which it means the gate of, they're all called Sharim, the gate of reincarnation. And there is a full rocket science, like a big, thick volume of the rocket science of our souls in these kinds of systems. But uh, I think we'll end today's class as uh, in a discussion of the, um, uh oh, Siri thinks I'm asking or something. We're going to end this class with a quick discussion of how we know it's true. This is how we know it's true. The way we know it's true is that, and, and I, I'm not going to be able to do the whole thing. That would be a good class in itself. But I'm going to skip a bunch of it and then just get to the point that I think you'll all get. So first of all, can we know that Torah is true? So I'm going to tell you, yes, we can. Okay? So we can know that Torah is true. When I say Torah is true, meaning it's actually divine. Moses didn't even know what he was doing. He was just basically, God was just sending it through his arm and straight onto the parchment. So the Torah we know is true. Now, do we know that the Torah does not explain even a single commandment? Not one commandment is explained. Yes or no? Explained or not explained? Not explained. Therefore, we know Torah is divine, and we also know that it, re it must have an oral tradition to explain it. I mean, it even has death penalty for multiple commandments, none of which are explained. So it's like, it's crazy. Like, yeah, you, it must be explained. And it's taking things seriously. If you read the Torah, think, those commandments are taken very seriously by the author of the Torah. Yet no explanation. So that's the oral tradition. Well, who's in the oral tradition? Well, it's oral. So it's hard to say. Thousands and thousands, millions of people throughout history. But because of the Roman people, because of the Roman monsters, Nazis, they, um, because of those people, the persecution was so great that we had to write down a book called the Mishnah. So in the Mishnah, it has whatever people were giving the oral tradition in that generation. And they had to ultimately freeze frame where it was at that point. It was a thousand years after Sinai. And they wrote the Mishnah. Who's inside there? Well, all kinds of people. Rabbi Yishmael, Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, you know, and so on and so on and so on and so on. Now, this stuff's all from the Zohar. And what's the Zohar? The Zohar, when you open up the Zohar, guess who's in there? I'm a Rabbi Yossi, I'm a Rabbi Shimon, I'm a Rabbi Meir, I'm a Rabbi Yehuda, I'm a this, I'm a that, I'm a that. It's the same people, exact same people. Well, how do you live your divine Torah? Based on the oral law, because that's the instructions how to actually keep it. It's not 10 after. It's not 10 after. It is 10 after. Did you get it? I don't know if you got it. Anyway, click on what you need to click on. Anyone needs to speak to me after, you can speak after. Um, click on what you need to click on, follow or subscribe, and uh, join the media club, Rabbi Yom Tov Media Club at yomtovmediaclub.com. Shalom. Shalom. If you enjoyed watching this, well, watch some more. Send it, click it, forward it, join it, subscribe to it. You know, keep coming on and uh, joining me in this amazing movement to make a big difference in the world. And the biggest thing you can do of all is to join the yomtovmediaclub.com. Please go online, yomtovmediaclub.com.